Greetings, another nutrition-related video. Many times I have seen the suggestion that I cover the topic of ketosis as it relates to nutrition, and this is what this video is about. I'm going to offer an overview of nutritional ketosis. Now, these days, one often assumes that everyone knows what it is and what it involves, but I'm not going to make that assumption here because I know that's not true. And even people who have some notion of it don't really understand what goes on. So essentially what this is going to be is a an overview of what nutritional ketosis is, how it's induced, what happens in the body, and then how you go about it uh, when you actually want to practice it. So nutritional ketosis is something that's been in now for a while, and it's sparked quite a bit of controversy. Uh, some people think it's unhealthy, some people think it's healthy, and I don't want to address those issues here. That's for a separate video, including the famed lipid hypothesis. That is a separate content. I'd like to separate the two. But essentially what nutritional ketosis is, is a different means of uh, supplying the body with energy. You need to look at the human body as a, a tiered uh, metabolic system. There are different ways of supplementing the body with energy. And the preferred way, and I'm using preferred in air quotes, the default way manner of supplying the body with energy is using glucose, which is sugar. Uh, all carbohydrate-rich foods supply the body with glucose. Uh, Carbohydrate-rich foods, for those who are unaware, are really basically anything that is uh, plant-based. Fruits, fruits uh, grains, etc., and to a much lesser extent, vegetables, and we'll get that to a bit. So the default mechanism of the body is to run on glucose. This is called glycolysis. Uh, the cells, the heart, the muscles, and in particular the brain, they all run on glucose vis-a-vis -vis glycolysis in its default state. However, the body, being very adept at survival due to evolutionary selection pressures, has other means and mechanisms uh, by means of which, of course, it can survive. It is not limited to glycolysis. Enter ketosis. Now, even though, certainly in Western society, and indeed all over Eastern society, the default position of the body is to run by means of glycolysis, burning glucose, sugar as, as a primary source of energy, it is possible to convert that system, if, as it were, to change the system so it runs off of a different energy so source, that is uh, ketones and specifically lipids. Now, to explain what happens, I have to talk a little bit about uh, the body's organs and, and how that all works, and I won't make it overly complicated. As long as you're supplying your body with a regular uh, flow of carbohydrates, it's going to run off of glucose. And the body, of course, responds by producing uh, insulin in the pancreas, which lowers blood sugar levels, and the whole system is regulated this way. But in cases of starvation, for example, when you have access to little or almost no food and certainly very few carbohydrates, the body has certain defense mechanisms, if you wish to call them that. Now, glucose is converted into something called glycogen in the muscles and the liver. And the muscles and liver, depending on how athletic you are, or your activity levels have a capacity of about 300 to 500 grams of glycogen reserves. This is, we can just for the purpose of discussion, say a different form of glucose, a different form of sugar. And it is possible to, vis-a-vis -vis starvation, not having access to food, or intense physical activity to burn through these reserves. The first of the glycogen reserves are, of course, found in the, in the skeletal muscles. They're depleted. And the last uh, bunch of glycogen reserves are found in the liver, about 100 grams. And they can be depleted too, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, pure starvation, uh, severe caloric deficit, that kind of thing, or just intense physical activity, things like sprinting, extreme uh, running, uh, intense weight sessions, etc., and really any physical, intense physical activity. Now, if you don't decide to, or it's not an option, to carb low, to fill up on, say, bread or fruit or, or any of these foods that provide starches in general, 
uh, amounts, large amounts of carbohydrates, which are then converted to glucose, further converted to glycogen. Uh, over time, what the body begins to do is it produces something called ketone bodies. And these ketones are an alternative energy source to glucose and glycogen for the body. Now, before I proceed, if you are a diabetic, uh, don't do anything uh, of any of the things I'm about to talk about. There is such a thing called ketoacidosis. It is a harmful and potentially uh, deadly. You can die from it if you have diabetes state. So none of what I'm about to say applies to that, and I won't talk further of keto, uh, keto acetosis. I'm speaking specifically of normal, healthy metabolism and what happens with regards to ketosis. So once you're de you've depleted your glycogen reserves, carb reserves, and you don't fill them up either through uh, carbo carbohydrate deprivation, intentionally induced, the nutritional ketosis, or just plain starvation, the body begins to produce ketones. And eventually, uh, it starts running off of ke solely, almost solely ketones and lipids, fats. Every cell, every muscle, every organ in your body can run, has the capacity to run off of ketones and lipids completely, with one exception, your brain. Your brain for reasons I'm about to cite, requires uh, a massive amount of glucose compared to other organs by dint of the fact that every other organ in the body can run off of fats and lipids. But you can reduce the brain's capacity to require uh, glucose significantly. You can reduce it to bound to about 40 grams a day, and I can ex I'll explain in a bit how that is gained if you are, in fact, in nutritional ketosis. Now, one of the reasons why I speculate, and I've I've not seen personally any research on it, though it would be interesting as to why the brain still requires glucose when the heart and the liver and the lungs and your biceps and everything else can effectively run off of lipids. Why this is the case is because the human brain is such an energy hog. Uh, the human brain is enormous compared to the rest of our bodies. One of the reasons why, for example, human labor for human females is so difficult is because of the size of the skull, the cranium, with respect to the brain. It doesn't come out easily, as it were. And our brains are just huge energy hogs. And as I said, the default position of the body is to consume glucose. So it would make sense from an evolutionary perspective that the, the large, large brain we have, relatively recent in comparison to other mechanisms, uh, has not yet, and probably likely will never adapt completely to using purely ketones and lipids as an energy source and will acquire some glucose. So there's that's my speculation, but I think it's supported by what we can observe in, in our evolutionary history. Now, it does take some time to become quote-unquote keto-adapted, usually somewhere around the area of three to four weeks. And after that period of time, your body completely uh, converts to the other tiered system, if you will. You're running almost entirely, with the exception of the brain, and even that's reduced off of ketones, uh, ketone bodies and lipids, and increasingly just fats as opposed to ketones. That is to say, in the beginning stages of nutritional ketosis, you, uh, you do use ketone bodies as an energy source more than you would pure, uh, pure fats. That changes over time, and the ratio goes way into favor of just lipids, fatty acids, as opposed to ketone bodies. Now, there have been studies showing that short term, anywhere from you know a few months to maybe nine months, there are definite quote unquote weight loss benefits. You tend to be able to drop fat more easily on a ketogenic diet than other means of, of nu nutritional dieting. And there are several reasons for this. Super long term, there haven't been too many studies, so there's no evidence either way. The suggestion is not this is, is not the case, but more study is required. And this is because hormones in the human body uh, exist sort of in a, in a two-tiered system as well. You have agonists and antagonists. Uh, an antagonistic hormone, seeing it sounds abstract, is simply one that can either be in abundance or not if the presence of another hormone, an antagonistic hormone, is also in high abundance. And when we're talking about ketosis, there are, for example, two, two very important hormones that are antagonists of each other. That is to say, you can either have one in large concentration or you can have another in large concentration, but not both at the same time, at least not through artificial means, that's just injection. So the hormones I'm speaking of are 
insulin and glucagon. Uh, insulin is a transport hormone. It is produced in the pancreas. It funnels nutrients, uh, glucose, protein, that is amino acids specifically, and, and lipids into the cells. It is a storage hormone. Glucagon, its antagonist, is a release hormone. In particular, it's very good at releasing uh, fatty acids for the purposes of energy expenditure and energy consumption. Neither can be found in high abundance or rather in large concentration if, if w one or the other is already in high concentration. That is to say, when you eat a really carb-rich meal and your pancreas is releasing uh, insulin to reduce your blood sugar levels, uh, you're going to have very low levels of glucagon. Conversely, if you've been in ketosis for quite some time, your insulin production is going to be very, very small or very minimal, and you're going to have relatively high uh, concentrations of glucagon release. And this, because glucagon is, as a hormone is uh, so effective at releasing fatty acids for a source of energy and using them and transporting them, it is a release hormone as opposed to a storage hormone, the opposite, hence antag antagonist or antagonistic of insulin, this lends itself very well to um, burning uh, fat. Uh, the other antagonistic hormone of insulin is uh, the human growth hormone, uh, sometimes called HGH, and somatotropin. And this is another hormone that you either have naturally, I'm not talking about artificial injections, you either have high amounts of uh, HGH present, which is often induced through low carb or ketogenic diets, because when you don't have a lot of insulin, you tend to have higher G, uh, higher GH HGH profile, or vice versa. And this, of course, is also very very uh, potent in releasing fatty acids for the purposes of energy expenditure, etc. So I'm just going to do a little review, so it's completely clear how one achieves a nutritional ketosis. I say nutritional because ketosis is a naturally occurring state when you're starving. When the body has nothing to eat, it naturally goes into ketosis. The difference between nutritional ketosis and starvation ketosis is primarily in that you are feeding your body probably in a, in a deficit, um, but nonetheless you're feeding your body a, lot, a large amount of fats, a uh, relatively medium amount, small to medium amount of protein, and, and very, very few carbs. But what happens once again is... When you deplete the body of glucose, specifically glycogen in the muscles and the skeletal muscles in the liver, eventually your body starts producing these ketone bodies and over time it adapts to using these ketone bodies in addition to fatty acids, lipids as an energy source uh, for just about everything with the exception of the brain, which requires some minimal amount of glucose. Uh, this glucose incidentally can be supplied via gluconeogenesis, that is the uh, creation of of sugar, of glucose, uh, from so-called branched-chain amino acids. Uh, you can get this through the protein you consume in your, in your diet. It's not a problem. That's, that, it's really simple at the end of the day. You either are starving or you deplete your body of carbohydrates, and then you go into ketosis. That's basically what it is. Now, there are varied opinions as to when you're not starving, that is, how many carbs are required or needed to, or how few rather, perhaps is a better way of putting it, to induce nutritional ketosis. The average seems to be about 30 grams. Some people say you can go as high as 50, and some people say you know fewer than 20. And it all really depends on who, who you are as an individual. There are means of measuring ketosis, the so-called keto sticks. I never really bothered since I have a pretty good idea of when I'm keto in ketosis or not. But... If we just sort of use the 30 gram benchmark of, of carbohydrates, you can see that immediately there is a, a window, a limited window or limited spectrum of, of foodstuffs in the carbohydrate area that you can consume. But I actually do think for the purposes of ketosis that uh, vegetables are very, certain vegetables are very, very important. One of the big downsides to nutritional ketosis, prolonged nutritional ketosis, tends to be a lack of fiber. Uh, animal foods, of course, have no fiber. Uh, fiber is ex almost exclusively the province of uh, plant foods. And there are a number of plant foods, plant-based foods, that are an extremely important source of fiber. Why do you need fiber? Well, at the end of the day, 
uh, you need to take a shit, right? And without fiber, you will be constipated and you won't be able to take that glorious dump. Fiber also has additional health benefits. Uh, supposedly, some studies have shown that it lowers cholesterol, etc. But it's, it's just necessary to clean out the system. Now, I'm going to talk about the kinds of foods that you can eat uh, or rather should be eating if you want to either induce nutritional ketosis or you are want to maintain it. And I do think vegetables and some plant foods are really important. And then I'll talk about all the other kinds of foods. Obviously, fruit is a no-no. You can't eat any fruit when you're in keto- you, want, you want to enter into ketosis or you want to maintain ketosis because fruit tends to have a lot of fructose, carbohydrate, sugar, etc. And you know, that's just a no-no. Vegetables vary. Uh, for example, you could eat a very small quantity uh, of tomatoes. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and likewise, say, bell peppers. But for me, the staple vegetables are greens, greens and whites, if you will. My two staple vegetables when I'm bothering to do ketosis, like I am now, are cauliflower, ca- cauliflower and broccoli. Why? These are amazing vegetables. They, they're so rich in minerals and vitamins, massive amounts of vitamin C, which you need. You, your body can't produce it. We're not dogs or, or seals. Uh, and you can't get vitamin C from animal products. Well, you can if you're an Inuit eating uh, seal blubber, but we don't do that. So, yeah, you should have vegetables. Cauliflower and broccoli are both just uh, power packed with incredibly important vitamins. And they're filled with fiber as well, and they're really, really low carb. Um, you can e- easily eat 300 grams of, say, broccoli, and still be well within ketosis without any problems. Uh, my only recommendation would be don't boil these vegetables; they lose their nutrients. Fry them, and as we'll learn, it's all about frying. I mean, you need to eat a lot of fat. The profile of the typical ketogenic diet is basically about 80% fat, 20% protein, five, sorry, 75% fat, uh, 5%, 20, 15% uh, protein, and 5% carbohydrates. That can vary. Sometimes it's 70%, um, 70% uh, fat, 20, 30, 40, 40, protein and, and 5% carbs. It really depends, but the point is you need a lot of fat. And you'll be using a lot of saturated fat too. I don't want to talk about the differences between the fat profiles. I want to do that in a separate video. But yeah, you really you really need to uh, get your greens in. And I would suggest broccoli and cauliflower as the champion vegetables for the ketogenic diet. Of course, there are other things you can eat. You can eat you know, onions in small quantities and what have you. And even, even tomatoes in very small quantities, bell peppers. Um, but yeah, you don't really want to exceed 30 grams ideally. Other things that are really useful for the purpose of fiber are nuts, but I wouldn't eat too many nuts, um, and I would only really eat one kind in my experience, and those are Brazil nuts. Why? Because Brazil nuts have a very, very low carbohydrate profile compared to other nuts, including almonds, pecans, walnuts, uh, and they have a lot of they have a lot of fat in them as well. So you're going to be adding some plant-based fats, which are good as well, to the diet. Uh, They tend to have fewer than 3 grams of carbohydrates for 100 grams, which is well over 600 calories. Most of those calories coming from fat, some coming from protein. And then finally, uh, as far as plant foods are concerned, I find flax seeds uh, really useful. They have a very low carbohydrate profile, maybe 4 grams per per 100 gram or even. And so you can easily have 50 grams, which is 50 grams are packed with fiber. um, And that's really useful. When I'm speaking of fiber, of course, there are two different kinds. There's soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. But let's just say for this purpose, the purpose of this video in this context, I'm mostly talking about insoluble fiber. I'm talking about the fiber is going to give you those high-quality dumps that you need to take sometimes. And, yeah, you need the vegetable matter. Everything else, I think, is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, all fat is game, save trans fats. You don't ever want to consume trans fats. But saturated fats are good. Monosaturated fats are good. Um, monounsaturated, sorry, monounsaturated fats are good. Poly, everything goes except trans fats. Um, so you want to try try out different kinds of fats. Saturated fats are actually very important for ketogenic things like coconut uh, oil, uh, the kinds of fat you would get in butter and lard, etc. 
And of course, all animal products are, are plausible. Everything, you know, eggs, fish, um, poultry, meat, etc. And if you like steak, you're going to love this because you can eat lots of red meat. Uh, anything that falls within the province of the animal uh, meat spectrum, yeah, you can eat that. But it is really important to, to have some vegetables, in my opinion, based on my own personal experience of having done this a lot. If you do not consume vegetable matter with, with insoluble fiber, you won't be able to take those high-quality dumps, and you will be severely constipated, and it's going to be, in the long run, a drag on your health. So I can give you some typical examples of how I go about it. Uh, sometimes I do combine this with what I mentioned in a previous video, intermittent fasting, where you know I, I tend to only have one big meal a day. Uh, sometimes it's just it's 1.5 meals one, or maybe even two. But for example, what I might do is in the morning for my quote unquote breakfast, my first or only meal, I will have uh, maybe a 300 gram steak. It's all fried in butter, and with that steak. I will fry up a 200 grams of broccoli and 100 grams of cauliflower, um, and I'll have about 50 grams of flax seeds and maybe just a handful of Brazil nuts, and that will constitute my meal for the day. So I'm getting the important fiber I need so I can take my dumps that are required, um, and I am getting a combination of saturated fat, um, and in addition to that, I'm getting um, plant-based, non-saturated fats from, say, nuts, and I, I usually take fish oil as a supplement, although I do eat salmon reasonably frequently. On the days I don't eat salmon, I do take anywhere from you know, 3 to 6 grams of fish oil capsules as a supplement. So I'm getting a lot of different kinds of fats. I'm getting a minimal profile of carbohydrates. It's not exceeding 30 grams. And I'm getting, most importantly, I think it's really important, I can't stress this enough, getting the fiber you need to be able to take those quality dumps. Because, believe me, I've tried no carb as in nothing whatsoever and you will you will suffer for that uh, unfortunately you you need to be able to take those dumps um just my experience it's it's quite unpleasant and painful no carb as opposed to ultra low carb which is what ke the ketogenic diet is ideally below 30 grams or below there of course is variation some people can get by in 50 some people need even fewer some people need fewer than 10 I, I, as long as I'm somewhere between 20 and 30, I'm okay myself, but it takes time to get to know these things. Now, one thing that should be strikingly obvious is there, there, there's just a massive quantity of foods that are excluded from your palate now. If you're going to be ketogenic for a protracted period of time, many, many foodstuffs are just not available. Obviously, fruits, you know, off the table. Um anything sugary, starches, breads, off the table, uh, even some vegetables. I mean, having you know more than maybe 50 grams of a tomato tends to be a bad idea because it has a relatively high carbohydrate profile and is a fruit. Of, it is technically a fruit. Carrots as well tend to have higher car carbohydrate pr profiles. Bell peppers are kind of a mixed bunch. So basically all starches, most conventional food is going to be off the table. A lot of people ask about dairy. Dairy, technically speaking, is okay. I mean, you can get no-carb cheeses easily. But I personally find cheese and dairy a bit problematic for keto. Maybe a little bit's okay. But I find that it tends to inhibit, at least in my body, ketosis. And so at least for the first couple of weeks when I'm adapting, I tend to avoid uh, the dairy stuff altogether. And later on, I might eat a bit of cheese every now and then. But I tend to st stick to strictly animal products, fish, meat, eggs, and the vegetables that I have described above. And so the real weakness of ketogenic, see, I'm not a, I'm not a, a religious uh, spokesman for ketogenic diets. A lot of people, they take this view of their own personal diet and nutrition and then seek to proselytize the world, be it vegans or keto, keto fanatics. Um, the downside is just the lack of variety. I mean, it's we can talk about the health stuff in a separate video. I, I tend to have elevated health, you know, elevated lip, improved lipid profile and whatever. But it just gets boring. You know, it gets boring eating more or less the same stuff over and over. And that's something you just have to sort of get through. It's obviously a lot more limited to a quote-unquote more balanced diet. Even a, even a normal low-carb, let's say a low-carb diet that keeps the carbs under 100 grams, that is no way going to get you into ketosis where you're using ketones. 
but it's going to open up just a, a, a vast amount of foods that you can eat without any worry. You don't really have to count carbs nearly as much. You can eat things like tomatoes, carrots. It's all not really a big problem. Starches, of course, are out, out as well, but it, within reason, you can eat kind of what you want. Um, but the real advantage, I think, is over time just how efficient your body becomes at using fat as an energy source, etc. Now, with respect to activities, there you can pretty much do anything as long as you're, if you're running on, on ketones and, and lipids, ketosis. In particular, there have been a lot of studies to show that uh, endurance activities are actually enhanced by being in ketosis. That is to say, there, is, there are two distinct activities you engage in. You can engage in anaerobic activities, which do not have sufficient oxygen present, so they actually require glucose vis-a-vis uh, -vis glycogen. And then you have anaerobic, and then you have aerobic, which is you know long distance running, the kind of you know fast walking, that kind of thing, where you do have sufficient oxygen present. Unfortunately, one thing that I've observed, and I think is just well documented, is ketosis isn't the best for explosive activity because those are just inherently anaerobic activities, and so the body will automatically resort to using glucose. And so, yeah, you're not going to have peak performance in all likelihood. You know, individuals are different if you are engaging in, say, weight training, hill sprints, conventional sprints. Uh, peak performance for that almost, almost certainly requires a sufficient supply of glycogen, muscle glycogen. Um, but, yeah, who's actually, if you're not a competitive athlete, it doesn't really matter. Everything else is good to go. And you can still train. It's just you're not going to be training probably at mass, maximum proficiency or the, the level that you're used to or accustomed to. But this is something you can do for as long as you want, the longest I've ever gone. It's been six months until I got bored with it. Um, and indeed, there are medical applications as well. Um, people, epileptics have been prescribed this. And there's even evidence to suggest that um, it's theoretical, a theoretical approach that cancer patients receive this because cancer cells, unlike uh, other um, cells in the body require glucose. They absolutely require glucose. So the idea in the medical, in some parts of the medical community, is that by depriving cancer cells of glucose vis-a-vis -vis ketosis, um, you are uh, al not allowing the opportunity to to replicate and to grow. And this could be in some way, shape, or form preventative of cancer. This is still very much in the hypothetical realm, and uh, but there are people exploring this idea and researching it. So another interesting aspect of things. Once again, I am not a, a religious proponent of any particular diet form. At the end of the day, uh, diet is a very individual thing. People feel different on all kinds of things. When I do ket a ketogenic diet, what I miss most is just variety, but I don't feel bad doing it. I feel perfectly fine. Some people just don't feel particularly great doing ketogenic, though oftentimes a lot of that has to do with not consuming enough fat. It's very important to consume a lot of fat, get most of your calories from fat. Remember, ketogenic is not a high-protein diet. It is a low- or medium-protein diet, and most of your calories come from fat with a minimal carbohydrate profile. But even if some people consume enough fat, I know I have a friend, he, he did it, and you know he felt like shit. He was doing it okay. He was following the rules, but he just didn't feel good. So he got off of it, and he's fine with what he's doing now. So, you know... I'm not saying this is the be-all and end-all. I would never say that. Nutrition is such an individual thing in my experience. You'll see one article, you know, parody, you know, this is what we need to do, and that's what humans do best. But when you consider the different uh, ethnicities, our different uh, ethnic origins, um, where, you know, I'm Eastern European, and, of course, I store my fat prominently in, uh, in my stomach. Now, there are reasons for that, cold, coming originally from a cold climate in all likelihood, the, uh, the fat is best uh, stored where it is to insulate art, uh, organs, whereas, you know, in, say, a sub-Saharan African population, the tendency is to store fat in the buttocks. So everyone reacts differently, and then the individual metabolism is just vastly different as well. Everyone reacts differently to different foodstuffs, feels different with different kinds of foodstuffs, etc. It's, um, it's a really individual thing. It's trial and error. But as I said in the fasting video, you know, everything is worth trying uh, at least once, you know, and I, and this applies to almost, almost everything in life, and certainly it applies to nutrition. Uh, for me, ketosis is a useful tool. I don't think I would ever envision myself doing it for more than, say, half a year. 
Uh, I do it sometimes just because, for example, when I was in Italy with my parents, I ate a shit ton of bad food, high carb bread, all that stuff. And even in a week, I felt like I was blowing up. So I, I decided here, I'm going to level it out now for a while through nutritional ketosis as well as a bit of fasting. Individual thing. I just wanted to outline what, what nutritional ketosis is, how you go about it, and for people who weren't aware as well as the, the hormones involved in the basic process. And I, and I hope I made it clear to everyone in a way that's easily understood and wasn't too technical. I do have more nutrition-related videos planned, and I do plan at some point in time creating a playlist because by now my channel is pretty diverse and I've talked about a lot of different things. But as you know, I will continue covering everything related to the human sphere, be it gender relations, uh, sociology, philosophy, linguistics, nutrition, you name it. That's my interest. So I look forward to your comments and I will talk to you guys later. As always, may your chosen deity watch over you and bye-bye.